question. But it's very annoying that this. this <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to stand up here and have like multiple <laughs> devices. Um, but uh, first, uh, thank you, Piero, and thank you to Berkeley, um, and thank you for uh, Leonardo uh, for having me tonight. Um, I really, really appreciate it, and it's fun to be able to share some work uh, with you guys tonight. So as Piero mentioned, uh, my name is Andrew Blanton. Uh, I'm a percussionist and media artist, um, and a lot of my work revolves around this idea of signal processing. Um, and working with uh, sound and computers. Um, so I'm the uh, area coordinator of the Digital Media Art Program uh, at San Jose State University. Um, and tonight I'm going to be talking about networks as art and extended interface. <clears throat> so with that said, let's jump in. Um, so I guess I, I've been having this, this conversation a lot with uh, a few of my friends about what it means to be a researcher uh, working in art, uh, which is sort of an interesting idea uh, when we start talking about what research means in specifically new media art or in the arts in general. Um, and that's a bit different from maybe what we think of as like, the humanities and how the humanities research happens or if we think about um, specifically uh, science and how scientific research plays out. Uh, and that's, that's something that's really uh, interesting to me uh, these days. So um, that's sort of where I begin. Uh, and I, I tend to focus on these two ideas, right? So if we're looking at uh, sense perception, um, this idea that uh, how do we as humans understand our world around us? And how is that reflected through uh, computers? And how is that reflected through the development of uh, computation? Um, this other idea of resonance and how we uh, think about resonance and what resonance means um, in general uh, as a concept and how do we work with it. So those are the two sort of large-scale framing uh, concepts that I, I've been thinking about a lot lately uh, within my research. Um, tonight I'm going to speak to uh, three primary paths uh, being technical, conceptual, and performative, uh, those aspects of my work. Um, these. Uh, these all tend to work. I got a phone call. That's not. <laughs> um, I shouldn't have answered it right. Um, but uh, within within these three paths, right? I have the technical, conceptual, and the performative. So uh, the technical being, well, how do we bring an idea into existence? How does that happen? Uh, the conceptual, why am I using uh, said technology to bring this thing into existence? Like, what are what are the reasons for uh, pursuing this medium, and how does that happen? Uh, and the performative. Well, as I mentioned, I'm a percussionist, so I play drums. Um, and how does that fit into this, uh, this entire narrative of building and creating with software as a practice? Um, so that brings me to two works uh, tonight that I'll be speaking to. Uh, the first, um, Waveguide, or rather, Modulator, um, which is uh, both of these pieces, I'm looking to address the research goals uh, that I work with, um, you know, and, and how does that play out uh, from an artistic um, standpoint. So the first work, uh, being Modulator, um, is a piece that I developed at uh, the Studio for Electro Instrumental Music in Amsterdam. Um, and so Stein is a place that's been around since the 60s. Um, it uh, was foundational to a lot of uh, early synthesizers, um, and they have really interesting prototypes there. So if you look at prototypes from the 60s, uh, from the 70s, from the 80s, and how that development happened, uh, it's, all, it's all really, really uh, interesting. And I think uh, some of these ideas of how they handled analog computation uh, versus uh, digital computation is a really interesting space in between. Um, so those are, uh, those are really big inspirations for me. Uh, in particular, I was looking at a matrix synthesizer, which started with a bunch of different synthesizers and then combined those two synthesizers uh, in this sort of matrix fashion um, to uh, create more uh, computational power than what was existent uh, within these uh, specific types of interfaces. Um, the... Uh, the other thing, well, 
So moving on, um, I basically when I when I began development of uh, modulator, I was working at uh, Stein as I mentioned, and I did the majority of the research in this library called Novocaine, which is an audio processing library uh, uh, developed um, at Princeton, um, and I found it to be fairly terrible. <laughs> it was it was excruciatingly difficult to work with, um, and then so I moved on to LibPD. And LibPD, if you're not familiar with it, is a uh, audio processing library um, for, uh, or well, it's, it's really an, its own programming environment um, for sound and sound processing, which is uh, pretty interesting to me. So um, I started working with, with LibPD, and in 2013, I uh, released a series of apps uh, into the App Store, um, this uh, modulator being the, uh, the third out of that series. Um, and so I think, let's see, I, I guess, I, you know, I'm, I'm like, I, the, the deck just gets so square. So I think it's better to just talk about the, the work and show the work itself. And I think if I have a table, maybe I'll just grab one of these. Sorry, Piero, if I'm like uh, <laughs> running around, he's filming. So I'll make sure and pace back and forth uh, to, you know, so he'll follow me back and forth. Anyway, um, so I think when I talk about the app, um, that's sort of the, the framing of what we're talking about here, right? Interesting, I think, uh, and important academically. Um, but when looking at the device itself and starting to think about, well, how do we do real-time sound processing and can I create uh, real-time sound fields? So again, going back to this premise that, well, if computers are based on or sort of sense the world in the same way that humans do, how can we work with that uh, within this device? So, uh, things that I found that were really interesting were, without touching the device, um, again, working with this idea of sense perception, I can uh, basically mix two sensorium, so mix sound with touch. And so I can begin to touch sounds, and I can actually extend that. Sorry, how, how does the feedback loop work? What is sensing what to make this possible? Okay. Microphone okay. intakes, processes. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So what's happening is that um, the sound is going into the device itself. And then that sound is um, is being ring modulated so in one way, yeah. Hands. In oh. very very basic, just reflection off my hands. My hands are forming a physical filter, right? So, so you're pressing sound waves downward, and right? exactly you're exactly. pressing those atoms towards it and away from it. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so the, the sound is, is bouncing off my my hand, uh, and then and then going back into the device uh, and creating a physical filter. Um, so this idea is is really you know. If we think about uh, you know this idea that okay, so if computers are reflective of human sensorium, going back to that thing, uh, then we can use this as sort of a work, a little you know sandbox uh, to start changing uh, those uh, sensorium. So it would also work if you take the tablet and move it against the wall. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's the same thing. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a really interesting uh, it's a really interesting phenomenon that I sort of you know was working with. So. Yeah, you'll notice that when I set the device down, so if I'm just sitting here with it live, right, whatever. But moving it, right, because it's the physical filter on the desk itself, right? So, okay. Um, this, I also was working with other uh, sensorium, right, so, or other sensors within the uh, device itself. Um, so working with different pitch bend and yaw, Right? So, uh, I think this, this idea of you know, using software as a medium uh, to really explore this stuff was, was really the, the principal area that I came into my research, right? And it's like, well, how does that uh, happen and work then? So, um, that's, that's uh, one. Um, the second one that I would like to talk about, I guess, tonight is uh, Waveguide. Uh, and so, 
perhaps maybe after we can uh, run some other demos because I was trying really hard to get the networks to play nicely with me uh, here at Berkeley, but it would appear that uh, port 3000 is closed on the network. So, uh, you know, that's the thing about networked pieces. Um, but I guess when I started working with, uh, with Waveguide, and I can walk you through some of the code base anyway, so you can see the general concept. And um, it's, it's really interesting to have a broad array of speakers that can actually uh, play it. Um, but I started with this idea of, okay, so what are other ways that we can create uh, large arrays of speakers for synthesis, um, and what new possibilities does this enable? So uh, in, my, in my studies with sound, I was working with you know, uh, arrays of eight speakers. So I started with you know, stereo, and then quad, and then moved into eight. Uh, 16, 32 channels, uh, great if you have a uh, super nice facility somewhere where you can uh, have access to 32 channels of audio, wonderful. Um, but if I'm going into a situation like this, well, it's very rare that you get any sort of really nice array of speakers like that. And I wanted to work with large arrays of speakers. Um, so um, that was sort of the initial premising of it. So I, I designed uh, this piece, and with help from friends, uh, I figured out some of the technical aspects of it, um, where I began working with um, a server, so from my drums I can have uh, that data uh, interpreted live uh, through Max MSP or Pure Data or something like this, uh, and then um, send out a different pitch or some data that then bounces to a server in Oregon. Um, and then we'll propagate back through uh, clients, uh, being cell phones in this case, right? So, um, interestingly, uh, this web page, then all this is all connected through WebSockets. Um, and the idea is to be able to uh, send data to everybody's phone in this sort of broadcast method, right? Of broadcasting data from a central performance rig uh, out to a bunch of different people. Um, so, okay. Um, so I, I did this using a number of technologies, uh, including um, Max MSP uh, for the uh, processing of the drum signals live. Uh, I used Amazon uh, Web Services, uh, Amazon EC2 server. It is basically the server side technology uh, running a node server. So node with web sockets, um, data passed from drums uh, to Amazon EC2 server, and then back uh, through a web socket connection to client side P5JS uh, doing real time audio synthesis in the browser. Okay, so interestingly, within the last year or so, we've had a real, um, a real like advantage uh, to be able to actually do real time audio synthesis within the mobile browsers. Um, and that, that has been a, a pretty big uh, breakthrough. And so that has allowed for this process of having um, these you know, multitude of speakers running. Uh, so if each one of you were to go out to this website, um, unfortunately it's not working right now, but um, I might be able to get it up and running a bit uh, to show you. Um, but I was going to show you that if you go to your uh, mobile phones right now, you'll see this up and running. And I'll at least walk you through the process because uh, I think it's somewhat interesting. Um, and we'll just talk about. You want to ask Carlo if you can log into the other network? Uh, perhaps. Is that a possibility to log into a, a bigger Berkeley network mm -hmm. other than the guest? I wouldn't know. Are yeah, secrets yeah. are mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> are you trying to hop on the internet? Yeah. Um, you can connect to my hotspot up there. Oh, really? Do you have a hotspot? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, what's your hotspot? Uh, Andrew, yes. andrewblanton.com slash? Uh, yes, so if you go on your uh, mobile phones uh, to this website, this is Andrew Begu. Excellent, we'll try it, we'll see how it goes. No promises, but we'll, uh, we'll see. Okay, so if you go to andrewblanton.com backslash node.html, that .html bit is uh, important. Um, 
So node.html. Uh, and that should redirect you to an Amazon EC2 server. Yep. Um, <coughs> yeah, here. And it should look something like this. Nope. Uh, it'll be on this one, actually. So here, um, we'll see. I'm not sure if it's working yet. But um, yeah, if you turn your volume up on your phone, you might be able to uh, begin to hear um, this piece. So this is basically sending from my desktop uh, computer here uh, to this Amazon web server that's up and running live. Um, and so let me just talk about, let me just walk through the, the framework really quick. We have about four minutes uh, while that's running. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll just talk about what's happening here. So this data is then sending from this client to an Amazon server and then back through uh, to this device, or to rather to your devices and to um, this uh, web page. So I was thinking about sort of this idea of creating a networked sound installation that could sort of transverse the planet, right? So it was amazing to be in Amsterdam for the first time and uh, hit this thing and then have data uh, go from, you know, uh, Amsterdam to the United States and then back all within something like a, uh, I don't know, a, under a tenth of a second or something like this. You know, it's in incredibly fast. Um, I had premised this work that, you know, it would be really interesting to have uh, that sound bounce into everybody's phones and then everything be all, you know, disparate based on network latency. Uh, but what I found was that the internet is, tends to be so efficient um, that everything would hit all immediately at once, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, but I guess if we just look at the, uh, the model up here, I have a few things running. So this is sort of a local host running right now. And if I bring up Max, um, we can see that this is connected to the EC2 server. Uh, with some JavaScript that my uh, friend helped me write. Um, but you can see this, whoa, <laughs> didn't like that. Um, but you can see that this is this uh, server where the data is bouncing off it directly, all in real time. So this stuff is all happening in real time and creating these uh, large scale uh, sound structures um, through uh, the network, which is really interesting to me, yeah. So what you're transmitting is is pretty much audio or some mod it's not notation. Or yeah, no, I'm not I'm not transmitting like the thing is uh, with the networks, audio is really, really uh, heavy. But it's just it's a lot of data. So uh, instead I'm just uh, sending a very small amount of data, like say for instance the pitch. Um, and then that is going to uh, going to then drive a synthesizer that's actually in your phone. Right, in your device. Yes. Are you synchronizing clocks, or it just happens when it happens? Uh, it's web sockets, so it doesn't need to be synchronized. It's asynchronous uh, by, by its nature. Yeah, which is interesting um, to me. So, um, yeah, I think uh, those are all the demos that I just that I wanted to run uh, this evening, and I think uh, I'm just about right on time. Yes? Um, what is the primary use of this? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Art? <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that fair? I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Um, is there further utility? Like, could cyborgs speak to each other? <laughs> maybe. I don't know. That'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be weird. Or is there maybe another application, scientifically or medically, or uh, within some sort of purpose in the sciences for trans transferring the the pitch to? Synthesizing. I don't know if that's the most interesting interesting thing probably scientifically uh, to me about it. I think what it does demonstrate uh, really in, a, in hard terms is the efficiency of the network. And so it, network. it does reflect it does reflect latency very, very well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is interesting. I don't know. I mean, that's sort of a solved problem already, right? Um, so but you think the speed at which transmits this is more useful than the compression of the microphone analyzing the compression. Yeah, sure, if, if I were really to think in that way. I mean, the thing that I'm not talking about now is that 
Um, so another component of things that I wanted to show uh, is that this application um, I developed this summer, uh, which is all within a single iPad, but it does uh, real-time uh, pitch detection and analysis and then sends that data back to the server also. Um, so this creates actually a complete feedback loop, uh, and this will listen to uh, the sound in the room, and it, it creates a really uh, big harmonic resonance structure. Okay, so these two things are sort of uh, sort of go together, right? Like if we talk about feedback and how the first uh, piece was using feedback, right? This piece also uses feedback, but it's a bit more structured feedback, if that makes sense. Um, it's, a, it's a bit more filtered in this way because we have multiple conversion types happening, right? We're going from, uh, you know, sound, and we're taking that pitch, and then we're converting it into a number, and then going back into sound on another device, and then converting that back into a pitch. Right? Uh, it's creating these, these feedback loops, um, all for performance. So, really, the the main idea, what I'm really working on with these, is to have uh, specific um, compositions that are embedded into applications. That's a that's a that's a really big uh, component of what I'm doing, and that's the research, I guess, like that I'm, I'm really trying to push is building in specific compositions within two devices. Um, 